call yourself now. <laughs> Irene? No, because you're, you're Good evening and welcome to the uh, San Bernardino City Council meeting of March 9, 2010. I'd like to thank the Garden Club, San Bernardino Garden Club, for providing our floral arrangement this evening. And I would ask uh, Carol to ask for roll call, please. Council Member O'Connell. Here. Vice Mayor Medina. Here. Mayor Ruane. Here. Council Member Ibera. Here. Council Member Salazar. Here. I'd like our uh, city attorney to lead us in the pledge, please. To the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Announcements. We don't have any special announcements this evening. We do have some presentations and uh, we will be presenting certificates to food service establishments recognizing their early implementation of the requirements of the City Sustainable Food Packaging Ordinance, which will take effect April 1st, 2010. Uh, Jim Shannon will give us a little report, and uh, after that I will read the names of the early participants and uh, have some special presentations. Jim? Uh, Good evening, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure, as always, to be before you, especially tonight, to uh, recognize these businesses for their contribution toward environmental sustainability. Um, as, as you'll recall, back in early 2009, the City Council adopted the Sustainable Food Packaging Ordinance. This ordinance prohibited the use of polystyrene in disposable food service ware and mandated that all food service ware be made of materials that were either reusable, recyclable, compostable, or biodegradable. Um, in order to give businesses enough time um, um, uh, to make the transition to these sustainable alternatives, the effective date of the ordinance was set at April 1, 2010. Um, in that intervening time, staff has done a lot of outreach with mailings and site visits, working with the restaurants and the suppliers to make sure we can uh, get everybody on track. And I'm happy to say that there are many restaurants that are uh, ready for the, will soon be ready for the April 1 deadline. And we have uh, a few of us um, of these restaurants have actually gone the extra step and been compliant well early of the April 1 effective date. And I know it's the City Council's intention to recognize those businesses that have made that sort of commitment. Um, so they're up here on the slide. Um, and we have a few of those businesses here tonight. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn to you. Good. Uh, I would just like to read the names of the, uh, the early compliance uh, uh, participants. Al's Kitchen, Carrots Coffee and Tea, Don Pico's Bistro, Fresh Choice, Howard Johnson, Express Inn, Kobisaki Restaurant, International House of Pancakes, Papa John's Pizza, Patio Filipino, Patisserie Ganache, a Rib Shack, Sam's Food Market, Senior Center, San Bruno. Uh, SFO Business Centers, West Coast Cafe, and the YouTube Employee Cafeteria. And I do have uh, some uh, certificates here for people that actually showed up this evening, and I'd like to present those now. They will go to uh, Carrots Coffee and Tea, Don Pico's Bistro, and the Rib Shack, Howard Johnson Express Inn, Patio Filipino, and the San Bernardino Senior Center. You can meet me at the podium, please. <laughs> San Bruno Senior Center. The last one, I believe. There we go. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Shake your hand too. Sure. Would any of the participants like to say a few words? Difficult, hard to do? Tell us about it. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah, owner of Carrots Coffee and Tea, and um, as far as the eco product stuff, it was a no-brainer. I just opened six months ago. I got sick of getting laid off and <laughs> kind of just dove in head first, flying by the seat of my pants. And it never occurred to me to get anything other than eco products. It's just, I don't know. I guess we live in the Bay Area. You're used to that kind of thinking. But 
just want to thank everyone in San Bruno. Everyone's been so supportive and kind, especially Jim, always in for, for lunch. <laughs> and Aaron, too, where we're coming in for coffee. So um, I welcome everyone to come by and check it out. Where are you located? San Mateo Avenue. Great. Yep. Just thank a you very much, and thanks to all of you. <laughs> thank Great. Review of the agenda, I'd like to move item 11, which is the annual report of the uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, to right after item number 8, which is public hearings. And also item, <coughs> excuse me, 10A is associated with item 8, so I would like to include the adoption of 10A right after item 8. All right. Approval of the minutes, regular city council meeting of February 23rd, 2010. There is emissions. Okay, the minutes will stand approved as... Uh, submitted. Uh, consent calendar, all items are considered routine or implemented earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested by a council member, citizen, or staff. What's your, what's your pleasure? Move to approve. Second. Motion second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Item number eight, public hearings. Notices have been published, posted, and mailed. We will hold the public hearing, waive the first reading, and introduce an ordinance of the City of San Bruno amending chapters 12.84, 12.96, 12.100, 12.108, 12.116, 12.120, 12.124, and 12.200 of Title 12 land use of the San Bruno Municipal Code. Staff, please. Thank you and good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. For approximately the last 20 years, the primary ordinance that's regulated single-family home additions and new homes has been Ordinance 1520 and is codified as uh, Chapter 12200 within the San, San Bruno Municipal Code. Overall, this ordinance has been very effective in what it set out to do, mainly to reduce the mass of homes and allow the public to have their input <coughs> into larger additions and new homes that are being constructed in their neighborhood. However, one aspect that has been missing from this process was setting in the design expectations that the city has early on in the process, rather than during the architectural review and the planning commission meetings. Um, with that in mind, the city council and the planning commission gave direction to create the residential design guidelines. This process included the creation of a planning commission and city council subcommittee, which gave staff direction throughout the process and met, and met four times. There's also been two joint planning commission and city council study sessions. One thing that became very clear during this process is that there would need to be municipal code revisions in order to support these residential design guidelines and make these design guidelines uh, very effective in being able to implement them. Uh, with that in mind, staff uh, drafted several code changes which we will present to you tonight. These changes were heard in concept by the City Council several months ago and also heard and, uh, and approved uh, resolution approved by the Planning Commission at their last meeting. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Laura, who will actually go over the different code revisions. And one thing to note is that the actual residential design guidelines are under a separate item, which will be heard immediately after the code revisions. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, so again, the item before you is specifically the ordinance that would amend the municipal code to implement the residential design guidelines. Um, these amendments are really specifically required for two reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first, to make sure that the municipal code and the residential design guidelines are consistent. And number two, to make sure that the guidelines are enforceable, um, as we commonly say, um, to say, so that they have some teeth to them. Um, so I'll be presenting the proposed changes um, by theme. It's really in three categories, but I would like to point out, because when you look at the ordinance, it looks like a lot of changes in a lot of different places. Um, and that's because when you look at our municipal code, several of these requirements are listed in multiple places in the code. Um, so staff has really done a thorough review of the code and found all of the places that need to be amended to be consistent. Um, but just for simplicity tonight, I'll be presenting those in the kind of logical categories. Um, so the first category is compliance with the guidelines. And so this is where we say what is required. And so in this case, what we're saying is that all new houses and any project that includes exterior alterations and those things require a building permit. 
So if it meets all of those requirements, then those projects must be consistent with the basic design principles of the residential design guidelines. So that's really the hard and fast rule, must be compliant. So the way that we actually implement that is in two ways. Um, if the project is going to be heard by the Architectural Review Committee, the Planning Commission, or by yourselves, by the City Council, and that's a discretionary review, um, then the approving body would have to make a finding of fact that the project conforms to the basic design principles. So the code amendment specifically says that for each of the different kinds of approvals that we have here in San Bruno. If alternatively the project does not require a discretionary approval and adjust a building permit, then the planning staff would review that project to make sure it conforms to the residential design guidelines. And so the code amendment would rest that authority with the community development director to make that determination. So the zoning code would specifically say, you know, that if a use permit or building permit is required, um, then it must comply with those residential design guidelines. <coughs> so the second category um, that we'd like to look at are parking requirements, and that's specifically for small new houses. So the proposed amendments would allow um, small houses if there are less than 1,825 square feet of living area, and that's a threshold that's in other places in our code, and that's why we've selected that. And if the lot is substandard in size or width, and our code defines that as being less than 5,000 square feet or less than 50 feet wide, so those lots would be substandard. Then the applicant could apply to get a use permit to approve a one-car garage instead of the normally required two-car garage. So this would encourage, we believe, um, smaller ho houses on smaller lots. Um, it would be, make a more effective use of the lower level, which on small lots has typically been used for parking or a tandem garage that isn't very useful, and provide more design alternatives. It's been very challenging to, for applicants to submit a good design with the current requirements. So that really seeks to address that. Um, larger houses would still be required to have the two-car gar two garage as is required in our code right now. Uh, the third category is related to front yard paving and landscaping. Um, based on the feedback from the City Council and also from the Planning Commission, we've really integrated um, you know, quite a bit of changes and really developed this section quite a bit more since you reviewed it last and, and from our discussions. Um, specifically, the front yard impervious surface would be limited to 60%. Um, I would like to point out that based on the discussion that we had, we acknowledge that smaller lots sometimes will not be able to meet that requirement, so there is an exception in the proposed code language that would allow the community development director to allow a higher percentage on a substandard lot. And you can think of it kind of like a, propor a proportion. So a smaller lot um, would have a, a slightly larger um, percentage. Um, the code requirements also specify that landscaping would be required in the front yard. Um, so that's a new element specifically saying that it would be located there. The trigger for both of these <coughs> requirements would be if the house is new or if there's an addition in floor area. And so after some considerable discussion, um, you may recall that we considered several different options for how we may want to implement landscaping and impervious surface. So after that consideration and after the legal review, um, staff does recommend this particular trigger of a new house or an increase in floor area because we feel it'll be um, the most practical to implement, um, consistent, and also um, legally very reasonable, and we can um, explain it to people very well. Um, you'll also recall that there was a lot of discussion about the actual landscaping and what kinds of plants. Um, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail on the next item in regards to the guidelines themselves. So as Aaron mentioned, the Planning Commission um, did review these municipal code amendments and did pass a resolution recommending that you adopt the ordinance. Um, if Council supports the ordinance this evening, it would again, of course, come back to you um, for a second reading. And so that concludes the presentation of the Municipal Code amendments, and we'll have some more detail in regards to the guidelines, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.
before I open the public hearing, any questions of staff? Yes, if I could. I, I, I corresponded with staff earlier today, and my concern is, is I understand, and being on the committee, I understand the one-car garage requirement for new dwellings. Uh, but the wording is states, if you can go back to that site, it, it states you can have a one-car garage, you can propose a one-car garage if you have less than 1,825 square feet, and then you can apply for a use permit. The ordinance today, if you have a one-car garage and you want to add on to your home or dwelling, and as long as you, uh, if you have a one-car garage, uh, the threshold is 1,825 square feet, but you can apply for a use permit for over that amount. So. I, I think I think we're not being consistent in proposing new dwellings because now we're limiting it to actually less than 1,825 square feet. So now you're saying 1,824 square feet, you know, and a use permit will allow you to have a one-car garage, whereas we can add on. I, you know, we've had you know, there's history of adding on to homes with one-car garages that are close to 2,000 square feet. So I I'm. What I'm getting at is that I'd, I'd like to eliminate, you know, use, still use the threshold and still use the use permit process, but treat a new dwelling as if it was being treated as, uh, as a, uh, an existing house with a one-car garage. Your thoughts? The, <coughs> there's, in our current ordinance, it's, there actually is an inconsistency. In our, in our current ordinance, if you have a home and it only has a one-car garage, and you propose with your addition to have less than 1,825 square feet, you're allowed to keep that one-car garage. If you propose to go over that 1,825 800, square feet as an addition, you're allowed to apply for a use permit in order to keep that one-car garage and not provide a second space. However, for new homes within our current code, you have to put in a two-car garage and that's it. Um, there's no use permit process. There's, there's not, there, I guess you would, in theory you could apply for a variance in order to do it, although I've, I've never seen anyone actually do that. So what this is actually doing is making the two situations more consistent in that there are some situations in which you can build a new home and keep a one-car garage. And the reason this came about through the subcommittee is we said, you know, we have a lot of these smaller lots that have been developed over the past five, ten <coughs> years, 2,500 square foot lots, where people just built too big a home. And one of the reasons that they built too big a home was they had to put in a two-car garage. And this two-car garage ended up taking a lot of the first floor, and so they had to build a second story above, and it just became too big for the lot. So this would allow two things. From a homeowner's perspective, this would allow them to only build a one-car garage and not, not you know, mess up the first floor plan by having too big a tandem garage on the bottom. And from a neighborhood perspective, it would encourage smaller homes on smaller lots because there's an incentive. You keep it under 1,825 square feet, you only have to have a one-car garage. So I think that was the intent behind it, but although it clears up some of the inconsistency between the, a new home and an existing home, there, there still would be that inconsistency for, for larger ones, where if you had an existing home and, had, and wanted to add a big addition, you could go through a use permit process even if you're over the 1,825. My follow-up to that, if I could, is if you're going ahead and changing the municipal code, why even going through a use permit process then? If you are under, if you're going to be that strict and say if you're under 1,825, why don't you just say that you can have a one-car garage? Why do you still have to go through a use permit? Um, that's a good point. I think that, I think with the, as we are developing this and talking to the subcommittee, I, you were on it, the, uh, yeah. I think the thought was that, hey, this is a change. And you know this might be something to the neighborhood, but I agree. If we, if I mean, the strongest policy to encourage smaller homes on smaller lots would be, hey, you're allowed to have a one-car garage if you build it under 1,800. And and, and I was on the committee, and yeah. and and this is just <clears throat> reading it now. I mean, I I it was my assumption that there would still be a use permit process, and you would still have to qualify within the eight, you know, the threshold area. But this is what, you know, I wasn't I, I wasn't. Uh, I was caught by surprise knowing that it was going to be at that the threshold is not a threshold anymore it's a it's a maximum yeah. it's a ceiling and that you know you can't you know, in 1825 or 1826 you would need a two-car garage 
Any other questions of staff? Clarify. <laughs> Um, thank you for your presentation, by the way. It was very clear, and uh, you're right. It, it made a lot more sense to go through it your way than uh, plowing through all this stuff, um, which I did anyway. But <laughs> let me let me see if I'm getting this right. You're saying that you want to see for new homes if they're building something that's 1,825 square feet or less, they'd just be by right allowed a one-car garage. And then if they want to big any build anything bigger than that, they have to go through a use permit process. Is that? Substandard lot. Not a on a substandard lot. Correct. On a sub, which is the first one. Okay. That makes sense to me. I don't see anything inconsistent with it. Uh, is uh, there by itself it is. Yeah. But Without the use permit. But, we, but the, 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 the city is, this, the city is rampant of many uh, substandard houses, not necessarily substandard lots but substandard parking. And there are houses that are improved to, you know, that cannot increase the parking. On, not on new homes though, on Not on new homes. So I'm just trying to say, why can't we have, if you're gonna have a use permit process, why can't we have a similar use permit process for new dwellings as, as we do for existing dwellings? Okay, now I'm turned around. I mean, what if I, I mean, do I, what if the perfect house is 1,900 square feet? Through the I chair. have to put a two-car garage. I, I think one solution to this might be that if we still want to incentivize building a smaller home on a smaller lot is that we write the code in a way that says if you build under 1,825 square feet, it's allowed by right. If you build over 1,825 square feet, it's a use permit process similar to an existing home. That's what I'm gearing to. Okay. I mean, that staff and the and <coughs> staff and the guidelines can you know can make it very clear that you know anything you know there's going to be a major threshold <coughs> after 1825, and you know no there's not going to be the 1950 or the 2,000 square foot house allowed or something. Yeah. I think that would balance it well as we'd still be encouraging people to build smaller homes on smaller lots by by having that. Uh, by right allowance. Any other questions of staff? Okay, I'd like to open the public hearing. This is a public hearing and it's your chance to speak on this item if you so wish. You state your name and street. Sean Barrelier, North San Anselmo. At your last budget meeting, I recommended a cap on overtime. I went to pay my water bill uh, last week. Excuse me, John? Yes. This is not uh, public comment. An item is not on the agenda. Okay. This is just this particular item. So okay, on this particular item, I was looking at that, and it, it doesn't say that you have to have a parking space at all. If you read it, it says requirements for new small houses, small new houses, and then it, you read it down, it doesn't say that you have to have a parking space at all. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but shouldn't that be said, shouldn't that be written? Suppose I, I, go to, I go to build a new house and I say, I don't want any parking in my, in my garage. I don't want to have to have a garage. Do I have to have a garage? Anything else? No, that's all. Okay, Scott? Yeah, that's, this is just a bullet point summary. In the ordinance itself, it says that you, you must have a garage space. Anyone else from the public? Can you speak on this? All right, this is your last chance. If I close the public hearing, you won't get a chance to speak again. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, public hearing is closed. Any more discussion or action? Um, I need to adopt the resolution. Or uh, waive the first reading first. Make a motion to waive the first reading. Second. Motion and second to waive the first reading. Any question? Change. Yeah. With or without the change that the council was discussing earlier. I think the yeah, second is on changing that. So okay. well, with, with the change. Okay. With the change. So second. Indicated earlier. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to adopt the ordinance. I'll introduce the ordinance. 
Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Council Member Ibera? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. Mayor Ru Wayne? Aye. And we'll just move on to item 10A because it ties in with this, which is adopt the resolution approving the City of San Bruno's residential design guidelines. Yeah. Thank you once again. Um, as mentioned, mentioned in the last report, um, Ordinance 1520 is what set the stage for how we reviewed developments in San Bruno for the past 20 years. The ordinance did a number of things well. Um, I think what it did the best was reduce the size of overall mass. Before we had this ordinance, you were allowed to build by right with a building permit with 40% law coverage up to three stories. So someone could essentially build 2,000 square feet on top of 2,000 square feet on top of 2,000 square feet. And there were a number of homes that almost did that which triggered us to go through the process 20 years ago, which recreated the Ordinance 1520. What it also did well is allow neighbors to give input in design and allow neighbors to understand what's going on within their neighborhood. Everyone within 300 feet of a home is noticed when something has to go through a use, when, a, when it has to go through a use permit. Uh, for the past several years, we also send out courtesy notices early on in the process to let people know that something's going on in their neighborhood so we could gather input early. And it has led um, to many significant changes. And I would say, you know, over, uh, over hundreds of homes over the last two decades have been changed for the better because of this process. But one thing that has been mis missing is something that lays out our design expectations ahead of time. There's been many times where we've changed things consistent th consistently through <coughs> the process um, on a number of different applications. And one complaint that we hear from people, not only in San Bruno, but another number of cities is, hey, there's a moving target. You know, I don't know exactly what you expect for design. And if I knew what it was, I'd design to that. But without knowing that, things change from city to city, and it ends up delaying the overall process by these back and forth design modifications. Um, so I think that was the primary objective as we were developing this, that not only would the homes be designed better, but we would set up a better process for property owners than San Bruno. And I'm confident that the document that we're presenting to you tonight meets both of those objectives. And that's thanks to the process that we went through. I think the process that we went through with the steering committee and the joint study sessions really made for a good document. Um, so with that, I will, I'd also like to thank Larry Cannon, who's, uh, who's here and can answer any questions tonight. He's also guided this process and made it an easy process for everyone to pr participate in. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura, who's going to focus on the changes that have been made to this document since the City Council last heard it in, in October. Um, thanks again. It's really a pleasure um, to be before you and make this presentation with the final draft of the Residential Design Guidelines after um, a somewhat lengthy but very good and productive process. So I would like to start by just briefly reminding you of what the basic design principles are, since these are really um, the backbone and what's required by the code. So these are really the direct, direct link, as we've talked about. Um, things like number two, respecting the scale and bulk and character of adjacent homes. This is really about fitting into the neighborhood. Um, number five, this is about the architectural details, matching the style of the home so you don't have a mix mash of different architectural styles coming together. Um, or number eight, using high quality material, materials and craftsmanship. Um, we really had a lot of discussion in the subcommittee about the fact that quality materials don't always cost that much more and that they have a significant impact on the design of the home and on property values and the quality of the neighborhood. So since your last review of the design guidelines, um, staff and the consultant have made a number of improvements. Um, those are included in the table as attachment one to your staff report, but I would like to highlight some of the significant changes that we've made. Um, first of all, we've really strengthened the introduction and strengthened the language to clarify that the basic design principles would be required by the zoning code. Um, we've also gone through and added municipal code citations throughout the guidelines, and that'll make it easier for the users to know the regulations and figure out where to find them if they need additional information. We've also added a significant number of new photographs. Um, as you recall, we, we got some feedback that it didn't really look like San Bruno. It didn't ring true. And now I think when you flip through the document, you can see homes that you recognize and the style of homes. 
feels like what we see in San Bruno on a regular basis. Also based on feedback from the City Council, especially Council Member O'Connell, um, we really strengthened the landscaping requirements. Um, specifically, you've probably noticed in the recommendations themselves in the main portion of the document, we have new recommendations for drought tolerant landscaping and water conserving irrigation systems. And um, we've also added a whole new appendix um, that just the, you know, the few pictures are here in front of you now. And this is supposed to be kind of a starting point to help people visualize what water conserving landscape can look like, what some of those plant selections may be. It really can be beautiful and environmentally conscious at the same time. And so that's what we wanted to remind people of. <coughs> and the idea too is that this is something you could take into the nursery and say, help me find <coughs> things like this. Um, we've also included some um, web-based resources that staff found to be very helpful and we'll be encouraging members of the public and homeowners to use those as well to choose plants that are native and, and drought tolerant. So we also heard some feedback, including from the city manager, that it's sometimes hard to picture what these things look like. Um, if I'm a homeowner and I just want to do something, what should I do? And so the idea came together for a new appendix that we've called Quick Fixes. And the idea here is to represent some smaller <coughs> things, um, which are in the guidelines, and then a couple of before and after pictures, like what's on the screen for you today, to really help people understand that thing, architectural details and color make a big difference in the appearance of the home, which I think we can all agree here. And that helps homeowners to understand what we're aiming for and a little bit more of how to do it. So along with the municipal code um, amendments, the Planning Commission did review the guidelines as well, of course, and they made minor recommendations that are detailed in the staff report. And then they passed a resolution recommending that the City Council adopt the guidelines. Um, I'd like to make just a few points in regards to implementation of the guidelines themselves. Um, we expect to do some outreach to designers and architects and let them know um, when the um, guidelines are approved. Um, we'd also hold a workshop for them if they have the interest in doing so to review the guidelines and the expectations and the process. Um, staff also anticipates that planners will be out in the field a bit more with the new guidelines um, doing in progress inspections. So we would actually be out, staff would be out while buildings are in construction, making sure that things are progressing the way we expect. Um, we've had a lot of success with our pre-construction meetings that we've been implementing for all discretionary reviews and we expect to use that same process for building permits. It's worked very well and improves the coordination with the building inspectors. And then planners will also be out in the field doing planning final inspections, which we do now for discretionary reviews and would do for other projects as well. So if you approve the guidelines this evening, um, staff has set up the schedule so that they would be effective on April 22nd. <coughs> and so the municipal code changes and the guidelines would become effective at the same time. And that would allow an opportunity for staff to do the outreach that I've just discussed and make the minor changes and um, updates that we need to do internally to be prepared um, to help residents um, when the guidelines are in effect. So of course we would need to make the very minor corresponding changes um, based on city council's action in regards to the municipal code. So we need to make just the, the fine wording changes for the um, 1825 one car garage um, that you just decided. So that concludes our presentation. Um, it really, we're, we're very happy with these results and appreciate this very good feedback that we received to allow us to take it forward to this point. So we'd be happy to answer any other questions. Great, a lot of hard work, so good job. Any uh, questions, comments of staff? If I could, uh, as being the, the member of the subcommittee and, and on behalf of former Mayor Franzella who, who gave a lot of good input through, uh, through the course of it, I want to thank Larry, uh, well respected. Uh, you've been a, uh, a value to San Bruno for many years now, and it, the document looks very good. This is, as a as the resident designer here, um, this is more of a, a friend of the design professional because it makes us makes it easier for us to do uh, the design and communicate to our clients to the homeowners. Um, it makes it easier for staff 
uh, and the Planning Commission. And I think that whole collaboration of, of committee with Planning Commissioners, longtime com Planning Commissioners, uh, and, and staff, and uh, just working together and coming up with this uh, long-awaited long document. I remember uh, Councilwoman O'Connell and I uh, 10 years oh ago. God. <laughs> yeah. wanting to uh, wanting to propose changes you know just get a little more specific and I think the best part of it is that everything and every everything that gets built every change that happens in this in this community in the residential area uh, will get scrutinized and uh, we'll have a uh, well you know, staff will have a better idea of you know what uh, you know what is good what you know what is good design uh, not only the built environment, but also the landscaping. And it's, you know, sometimes when there wasn't the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the use permits or the architectural reviews uh, was a minor additions or something, uh, you know, who knows what you would going to get. You know, so I think uh, everything is going to be uh, reviewed and I, I look, really look forward to it. So I thank my colleagues, I thank the staff and uh, Larry, you know, and Looking forward to working with it. Any other questions or comments? I, I just want to say um, I'm delighted with the before and after pictures you put in. It made everything so much clearer. And for us non design people, it's so much easier to point, oh, yeah, I want that. And I really appreciate the landscaping part, um, the part that you have in the agenda tonight. It's again, you, you, this is just marvelous. Ken is right. We started at least. I think it's longer than 10 years ago. <laughs> so it, it was a long time ago that we, we he and I came together and said we really want some things that we can point to and, and a better process. And, and now it's finally here. So this is very exciting to us. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Great. Action? Um, you want to? I'd be delighted if I can uh, introduce the resolution. Is that what it is? Or, or do you need a public hearing first? I'd be happy to introduce a resolution for adoption for design <coughs> guidelines. Councilmember Ibera. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor Ruane. <laughs> Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruane. Aye. You got two votes. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. With the indulgence of the council, I want to back up just a little bit briefly. Uh, we do have one latecomer who was uh, especially recognized for his participation, early participation in the food ser service uh, establishment, sustainable food tax from ordinance, and uh, he probably is a few minutes late because I think he had some stuff on the stove maybe, but that's Itzak, <laughs> Itzak Mejia. Would you uh, like to say a few words, Itzak? He was at the forefront, up at the podium, Don forefront Pico. of uh, participation Don in this. The owner Thank of Don you. Pico's and the Rib Shack. Thank you. Uh, I just first just wanted to comment and say that I know that I was very opposed about this uh, ordinance at the beginning, but um, my concerns again were that there was not any packaging that actually could handle the product that's out there but uh <clears throat> i did find a company that does have very good product and uh, i'm using it as of now um, and i'm happy with the products it's made my changes a lot easier a lot more expensive but i'm hoping that the public receives it well and uh, i'm excited about helping talk to other merchants about doing the change because uh, uh, I'm getting a lot of good reception from my customers, so I'm happy with the changes. Good. That was Congratulations. Good. We appreciate that. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> All right, then we'll move on to item number 11, which is to receive the annual report from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, and I believe uh, Randy Braze will give that report tonight. Feel bad, Randy. <laughs> Very patient. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Randy Brace, and I'd like to start by introducing uh, the committee members. And uh, first, I'd like to start by introducing Walter Bird, Chair, who is present. Um, uh, George Yang, Vice Chair. Carl Nicolari. Doris Mays from the Traffic Safety and Parking Representative, uh, David Nigel, Parks and Recreation uh, Commission Representative, 
Joel Samut, the Planning Commission representative, and uh, our City Council representative, Michael Salazar, who is uh, new to us for the year 2010. I'd also like to introduce and thank very much for their hard work, professionalism, and support, Laura Russell, uh, the, uh, as you know, the Associate Planning uh, Planner Community Development and Jim Shannon Management Analyst for Public Works. Uh, and I, I'd like to go out and say that the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee really, really appreciate uh, their efforts and feel very fortunate to have their participation and their guidance, and they, they help us a lot. Um, tonight, I'd briefly like to uh, recap some of the accomplishments for the year 2009 and present some goals for 2010. Uh, outreach and education. Uh, for the seventh year in a row now, uh, committee members have participated in Bike to Work Day. Uh, and this past year, uh, we helped man two tables, uh, supplying refreshments and informational flyers. Uh, also, commute.org provides us with posters and, um, and other supplies like uh, bike swag. Uh, and I'd like to uh, recognize the support of Karen Sumner, who gives us uh, some of these products. Um, also, for the sixth year in a row, uh, Posey Parade. We've had an informational table at the Posey Parade, and you can find us usually at the city park, and perhaps you've seen us, walked by us, and picked up some informational flyers or some bike swag, again, supplied by commute.org, and we appreciate their assistance. Uh, committee members also participated in Arbor Day cleanup at John Muir School and another info table at the city park. Uh, last year, you saw one of our public service announcements that we produced about bike helmet safety. Uh, early in 2009, we, we rolled out our second 30-second uh, PSA called Stop, Look, and Wave. Uh, and I'd like to play it now. Special thanks to Miriam Shali and uh, the staff at the San Bruno Cable for their help in producing and also uh, airing the public service announcements. Um, the phys uh, physical improvements. Uh, the committee divided into three teams this year to identify and prioritize ADA accessible curb ramps in the pedestrian emphasis zone. Uh, the curb ramps are, are currently being installed as part of the sidewalk repair program. Uh, we're also working on developing uh, pedestrian and bicycle wayfinding signage around the BART station, shops at Tanferan, and the crossing. Uh, the program is funded with a TDA Article Three grant. And now on to some goals for the year 2010. Um, we hope to bring forth recommendations to the City Council uh, on wayfinding signage through the city of San Bruno for both bicycle and pedestrians. Uh, we want to continue outreach with more public service announcements. Um, we'd like to assist with more bike road rodeos, possibly with the San Bruno schools. Uh, and, and we would like to uh, coordinate with the police department to identify bicycle safety efforts and work in conjunction with them. Um, Public participation in our monthly meetings uh, is up, and we encourage more. Uh, we want to continue to identify and be a voice for community needs for future development of San Bruno, including pedestrian and bicycle master plan. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for uh, Randy? If, if I could, as, as uh, the city's representative on the on the CCAG Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, I. I commend this committee for the last five years and in their participation and the application, the grant applications that we've been able to secure. Uh, one thing is that bicycle and pedestrian uh, projects are becoming now 
big throughout the county and throughout the state even. And there's a lot of money out there, uh, especially once since it's been included in Measure A funds and federal funds. So I think we need more awareness on, you know, I need more awareness on biking. And what I'd like to propose also is that the committee also sponsor more, th more than rodeos. I'd like the city, just like other cities in our, in our county, to promote uh, some biking events uh, for adults also. So, I mean, I know we have the Bike to Work Day and I know we have some of the, you know, bike safety things, but I think if we can promote some, uh, some deal where we can, and maybe partner with our neighbors, you know, because mm -hmm. we have bike routes that go up and down the county. Uh, but I, I do commend you on uh, what you do and uh, look forward to working more with you. Great, thanks. Thank Duly you. noted, and those will be topics in our next meeting, I'm sure. Thank Good. you. Thank you, and uh, like all of our, our boards and commissions and committees, you do a wonderful job. It's all volunteer, and we could not exist without all of you, so it's, it's really, really appreciated. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. All right, we'll go to item number nine, public comment, and item is not on the agenda. It is the Council's policy to refer matters raised in this form to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the Council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. Anyone have anything under public comment? That was a good time. My apologies for speaking uh, out of turn on, on as far as the agenda was concerned. Beginning again. Uh, I went to pay my water bill and I saw this on the on the bulletin board. It invites your application for fire captain. At our last budget meeting, I recommended a cap on overtime. Uh, I'd like to make another recommendation here that we put a cap on promotions and hiring that we freeze until we're in a more viable financial situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak to the council? All right, we'll go on to item 10B, which is adopt a resolution approving amendment to the city council agenda format. City Clerk. Honorable Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Currently, the city notices separate meetings and has separate agendas for our city meeting. So we have, we show, we have a city council meeting and we have a redevelopment meeting and it's two separate meetings with two separate roll calls. And some minor, inefficiencies result from this because we do do two separate meetings. I reviewed several other cities and they combine their city council meeting with their redevelopment agency meeting and I am rec recommending that San Bruno do the same thing. So I'm open for questions. Questions of the city clerk? You all understand what's being proposed? Mm -hmm. So would it if I could, it, it would be, if we had a redevelopment agency uh, meeting be, tonight, where would that be in tonight's agenda? Everything will be under the same format that our city council meetings are now. So at the top of your agenda would be city council and San Bruno redevelopment. And if I had a um, consent item for redevelopment, it would be under consent calendar. If I had a discussion item, it'd be on the conduct of business. If it was a public hearing, it'd be under public hearing. If it was a financial thing like, like we have done previously, we would show it under conduct of business to adopt a resolution for the council, and then the following item would to be to adopt the, the same for the redevelopment agency. Just, uh, just a quick question, Carol, when you would put them under there, would you designate it somehow that it's a redevelopment item? It would always show it? redevelopment. So if I adopt it, if we were adopting a resolution for a redevelopment item, it would show it was redevelopment. Okay. <coughs> Anything else? Action? Any other questions? I'll go ahead and introduce the resolution. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Council Member Ibera? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Ruane? Aye. Good. Uh, item C, 10C, receive a report regarding the City of San Bruno's Green Fleet Initiative.
Good evening. I'm presenting this report tonight in response to the City Council's request for a review of staff's progress and efforts in complying with Council's direction to be a leader in Green Fleets. The City, count, the city of San Bruno vehicles travel over 900,000 miles per year, making our fleet responsible for reducing 17 percent of the City's greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> Reducing these emissions has become a priority focus for the Central Garage. This slide shows emissions by department, and as one would expect, public safety, which has a 24-hour operation, is the largest source. It also shows one of the problems that we have incurred in our Green Fleet efforts, which is that technology changes in public safety vehicles has been slower than that of other vehicles. The flex fuel vehicles that we are now buying is a step toward the future, but it is not helping at this present time. At this time, we are using a four-step strategy to reduce our fleet emissions. <coughs> the first is a reduction in fleet size. A recently completed vehicle use study identified one truck used by public services that has been taken out of service. A van that was underused by our recreation department has now been converted to a mobile water sampling vehicle and eliminated another vehicle from our fleet. Three more vehicles are currently being evaluated for permanent removal. The thermal plastic unit that the council recently approved for purchase is on order and when put in service, another vehicle will be permanently removed from our fleet. The second is improved fuel efficiency and, and decreased emissions. We now have two hybrid vehicles on our fleet. One of the two hybrid vehicles was a perfect replacement for our vehicle needs. The other was made possible by the reassigning of vehicle use. For that vehicle, we had a vehicle that needed to be replaced for the park department that was being used for ball diamond maintenance and an alternative fuel vehicle would not work for it. We identified a vehicle being driven by a supervisor that would. We reassigned the vehicles and that enabled us to purchase a hybrid vehicle. This is a practice that we're continuing to use and believe will be the most effective way to bring green vehicles into our fleet in a timely manner. With our diesel vehicle and equipment replacements, staff delayed the recommendation of replacement of three trucks and both of our large mowers until the new cleaner burning diesel engines were available. As stated before, the eight flex fuel vehicles represented the first major change in technology of public service vehicles. And we're looking at new hybrid technology for future replacement of larger vehicles such as the aerial lift trucks that are used by our cable TV and the large dump trucks that are used by public services and park departments. The third is using new alternative technologies to replace our old vehicles and equipment. We now have three low speed electric vehicles in service that are used for limited purposes. We did make a commitment to participate in an electric vehicle and infrastructure demonstration program. The program was canceled because of lack of funding, but we are continuing to look at electric vehicles to fill future vehicle replacement needs. Okay. Research toward biodiesel came to a stop when we discovered that our diesel storage and dispensing facilities were not biodiesel compatible. The new above ground storage tank that should be installed by the end of this year will allow us to readdress biodiesel. We currently have one CNG vehicle in our fleet and technology changes have now made it possible for us to consider a CNG vehicle for our soon to be replaced senior bus. The fourth is the upgrading of existing equipment. This is the equipment that was installed on a vehicle after purchase, our small equipment that is used in the field. 
although it is not talked about as much as hybrid, biodiesel and CNG. The equipment upgrades is one place where we've made great progress. The LED lighting that is installed on some of our vehicles eliminates the need to keep the vehicle engine running while you're at a work site or a traffic accident scene. The new water service truck that council approved and is on order has an onboard air compressor that will eliminate the need for the old toad behind unit. And the city's portable message board uses solar power to regenerate its batteries. Uh, staff is currently looking at rechargeable portable light towers to replace the diesel units we now use. Changes to existing equipment has been done on an as needed basis. I thank you for your time and I will try to answer any questions. Any questions to staff? Thank you, Chair. Michael? <clears throat> I have a few questions. Um, starting with um, the availability of alternative fuels, uh, I know that we're, we're waiting for that storage tank so that we can have uh, a facility for biodiesel. But is there biodiesel available anywhere in, in the surrounding area where we might be able to consider uh, purchasing it uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost until that time? I believe some of our local cities use it. I'm not positive, so I can't say positively. I know South City does use it. Daily City has a small amount of biodiesel being used. I believe it's available at the airport. So we could look into uh, some sort of purchasing from another agency. Um, in in general, though, we were able to provide our fleet the fuel at a, at a lower cost than if we were purchasing it from even another agency? And then yes, correct. Okay. Okay. And um, as, as far as the, um, what do we know about the, the efficiency and the cost uh, per gallon of biodiesel? I mean, if we're going to make a, an investment to go that way, is it really going to be cost effective or is it really a, a, an environmental decision versus a, a cost effective decision? Yeah, it's it's going to be both. Um, cost of biodiesel uh, varies depending on supplier and uh, depending on the percentage of biodiesel um, bringing into our fleet. We phase it in starting with a B5 and then moving up. So 5% biodiesel and then you move up from there up to an acceptable B20 is the largest that anybody is uh, running right now. Um, most of the cities that we surveyed they are using B10 and they've stopped there, although they started at B5, some only B5. Costs range anywhere from 20 to 30 percent higher per gallon. So there's a substantial cost, so that would have to be weighed against the uh, environmental. Okay. And uh, as far as having ethanol available for the, the flex fuel vehicles, the police vehicles, is that anything that's anywhere near being on the horizon? Um, nothing's available in our general area. Um, the only public ethanol station is in Berkeley. Um, there are some private ones in San Francisco and uh, nothing in just the general area of San Bruno at, at this time. Um, we don't have dual storage capacity so we could not convert because only part of our fleet is uh, ethanol mm -hmm. compatible. So that would require probably a whole separate storage tank. A, a separate storage, probably to our advantage when it becomes available in the area to purchase it separately, yes, I suppose. Okay. But and uh, I had a question about clean diesel. Um, the, the cleaner diesel, diesel vehicles, how do they differ from the dirty diesel vehicles? Is it just that they're more efficient? Uh, yeah, they're more efficient. They run a catalytic converter. They run filters for um, uh, particulate matter. Um, we've, uh, I first noticed that we just completed a retrofit of two of our older diesels with the, uh, the new um, state mandated retrofits that clean up the diesel. Uh, running one the other day where normally when you stand behind a diesel truck everybody smelt that when a bus goes by. You didn't even know the engine was running while it was operating. Um, the emissions are extremely low um, and a lot of the studies and, and most of the studies I've read came from the diesel industry, so um, you have to balance that out. But most of them show that they're uh, polluting on a level of a CNG vehicle. Um, so the pollution level has come down substantially and technology is making another step forward this year, uh, which will lower it even more. That's great, that's great. Uh, one, one final thing, when, um, when, when you talk about the uh, CO2 production, 
is that just estimated on <coughs> miles driven, or is there a, a, another formula that you use to calculate? Um, that was a study, and it was we supplied the data, and it was based on old data, and miles driven mm -hmm. uh, was what used for our fleet. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Through the chair. Uh, I had two. One was already uh, answered through Council Member Salazar's question on the costs and uh, trying to understand the, the ratio. And it's indicated here it will be more costly. However, obviously, it has its very uh, positive effects for the environment. So I, you have to address that. Dave. But also, we're talking about uh, staffs looking into the portable light towers to eliminate those in, in essence for something else. Is that because? We're just trying to be more efficient. Is it because uh, we need to replace them that come to their lifespan, or are we just moving ahead, but we still have some sort of useful life left? Yeah, we um, we make it a practice not to replace anything before it's needed. So um, they will be replaced at a time when they're needed. There's a, a need for, um, I believe, a new one in the water division, um, and we're looking at it there. Um, and so every time we look at um, a new purchase, we look to see what we can do to become uh, more environmentally friendly with our purchase, and that's why we're looking at these towers. Um, one of the things that was that if you're not running the generators to run these lights, you cut the noise pollution also as well as the environmental pollution. So they're they're rechargeable. Plus, you don't have if you happen to be the person who's living next door to a, a crew working in the middle of the night, that's one less piece of equipment out there running. Um, not that that's a big savings, but I've been out at night; it's extremely loud, and anything we can do to improve and that was one of the reasons we first started looking at it was um, to make it a better uh, things. And then we, um, when we found, looking for it, we found the rechargeable ones, which is an advantage overall. Um, they'll put out the same light, and uh, plus they're portable where we can, the ones now we tow in, these are portable where we can bring them in and set them up in a locations that you can't normally get equipment into. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you're looking at this in a fully comprehensive way. I mean, there's, there's trade-offs here. So people say electric vehicles, uh, you know, don't pollute, but you have to plug them in at night, and that energy has to come from someplace. I know fully in Europe, there's probably a good over 70 percent vehicles that are that are clean diesel, add blues and urea injection, and all different kinds of things to look at. So uh, I'm glad you're looking at it in a comprehensive way, uh, and not just a you know, quick let's jump on something, because there are other other factors that, that offset some of the pluses. So it's good. Good report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, item D, <clears throat> adopt a resolution authorizing application for California Department of Transportation Section 190 funds in the amount of $10 million for the construction of the San Bruno Grade Separation Project and authorizing the city manager to execute a memorandum of understanding with the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board to pass through the Section 190 funds. Staff report, please. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, in, back in 2006, uh, the City Council approved the transfer uh, of uh, the application <coughs> from JPB uh, to the City of uh, San Bruno. The reason why the City agreed at that time to transfer the application for a uh, rail safety grant uh, program was to support and to help JPB to remain eligible for further grant application for other, other agencies. They have a uh, five million limit uh, for uh, any uh, given agencies and uh, they cannot then uh, uh, apply for any uh, further uh, grant application. reason why uh, back at that time in 2006 the city agreed to uh, transfer the grant application to the city of San Bruno as uh, the main applicant and uh, uh, asking uh, with the hope that uh, uh, the Great Separation Project will receive uh, $10 million uh, from uh, this uh, rail safety program. Based on the latest uh, safety rating uh, through the whole state, uh, based on the latest information, uh, our great separation project is rated uh, fifth in the state, uh, which will make us eligible for uh, to apply for this uh, rail safety grant. And uh, hopefully, the great separation project will receive 
uh, this uh, 10 million uh, dollar uh, state uh, grant fund. The resolution will enable the city to apply for that uh, uh, grant and the MOU, in a sense, set uh, the tools in place and clarify uh, the fact that this is a pass-through funding for this project. The city will have no financial obligation or whatsoever as a result of this uh, transfer of the tire of the grant to the city. And uh, uh, JPB will invest including uh, the resources necessary to develop the grant uh, to apply. The city will just review and uh, will execute those agreements as uh, needed. On uh, the city's part, uh, very limited time will be necessary to uh, review those documents and to sign or to go physically uh, for some hearings or uh, uh, like how we'll be next week uh, at uh, and PUC will be uh, the approval of the rating for the whole state and uh, uh, the city will be present uh, alongside with JPB uh, at that he hearing. My recommendation is uh, uh, to approve uh, this uh, action and to authorize uh, the city manager to uh, sign those uh, documents. Right. Questions of staff on this item? Okay. The chair, I'd like to adopt the resolution. Ten million bucks. Council Member Ibera. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruane. Aye. Uh, I'm going to skip over E and F. Uh, just uh, temporarily here and go to G. Uh, we have our police chief who's in Norbury tonight uh, presenting the, um, uh, not presenting, but uh, watching them hopefully adopt the resolutions that we're going to adopt this evening. So I'd like to go to G now, and then when the chief comes, we'll do E and F. Hopefully he'll be here by then. Uh, item G is receive a report and recommendation from staff and the Parks and Recreation Commission regarding a project to install synthetic grass at Lions Field and provide direction to staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, as I walk through the report, Commissioners, Park and Recreation Commissioners uh, Pierce and Davis. Uh, Commissioner Greg Pierce is the chair of the commission. Uh, Lord Davis is the past chair of the commission. They also both sit on the athletic field committee of the commission, and so they will be <coughs> helping out with the report. I am not operating without a net tonight. I've got great support here. The item before you is an update of information regarding um, a project or a proposal to install synthetic grass at Lions Field. And this is item, um, there was a joint meeting between the Park and Rec Commission and the City Council back in September. This is an update of that information. There are four areas of use um, at the facility. Um, what we have here is a batting cage, um, Lions Field itself, then there's a middle area, and then Bel, Bel Air Field. The batting cage and lion's field are both owned by the city. The middle field and the and Bel Air field are both owned by the school district. The thumbtacks in place there show the work that, ha that the city council has already allocated to have done. The batting cage has been installed and it is now being used by the various youth leagues. The dugout fencing, the outfield fencing, and the bleacher and the paving area around the bleachers. Um, on the paving, we are waiting to we get better weather to get some of that work done. On the fencing, we are holding off on that project to discuss the, the idea of synthetic turf. If you're going to install synthetic turf, it would be re mean to remove the fencing anyway. We would hate to do the work and then come back and have to do it later on. At this point, the fencing um, is all acceptable for another year of play, so nothing is, is lacking there. One of the first questions that I'd just like to address briefly is why Lions Field is proposed. And as I think all the council members are aware, the Park and Rec Commission did a very extensive survey, a study of all of the, um, both the city and the school district fields within the city. And Lions Field was selected as the most viable option 
um, as it is a city-owned field, but also because it has no immediate neighbors, it already has existing lighting system, and it has an ability to have uh, multiple uses. Currently, Lions Field is used for youth baseball and adult softball leagues. This would be a lining plan, um, and what we would see here is every, on the infield, everything inside the fence line, inside this fence line, would be all synthetic grass. What we see here is the infield would be a brown synthetic grass, the outfield would be a green synthetic grass, and obviously those lines are much thicker than they would actually appear in real life. But just so they show, that would be, um, those lines would be sewn into the field. The yellow would show where the soccer lines are. The white lines would be for the foul lines for baseball. We would put the black lines in there for the adult and the flag football activities. And so this is done on several different fields. There's a shot later on of Red Morton and Redwood City where they have different colored lines on the fields. And it works out very well as the athletes get used to those. But it does allow for many different um, sports or activities to be scheduled on the same field. I'm not going to go through this slide in much detail, but we, what we did is look at the amount of usage that's done right now on each, um, for each month at Lions Field, and then discussed what possible new hours are out there. And we looked at, I think we took a very conservative approach. We did not say, gee, nobody uses the fields on a Tuesday during school time at 11 o'clock. Well, it's not a reasonable time. We only looked at what we considered viable times when groups might use the facility. Um, yes, we could rent the field in daytime use to corporations that are doing activities, but those were not the hours that we counted in this survey. What we came up with with the bottom line is 560 hours of new use or increasing <coughs> the capacity of the field by 67.4%. Um, the commission, I mean, sorry, the city council also asked us to do an assessment of the parking in the area. And what we show here is that there's 122 existing parking spaces in the area. And these are the legal parking spaces that we're counting. We do know that a lot of, when it gets crowded, there's a lot of people that park over there. We didn't think it would be right of the city to count spaces that weren't legal. So what we have here is 122 spaces. 36 of them are in the lot immediately south of Lions Field's infield. The others are scattered throughout the outfield. The one lot of 23 parking spaces right in here is owned by the school district and is, pro is primarily used for the teachers at Bel Air. The district has asked us, or the principal has asked us not to use it for weekday games um, to keep the regular season games off of there. However, if we have a tournament, we can ask the the district to open up the lot and we can use the lot. What they're really afraid of is just ha giving enough space for all of their teachers to not only park but also to lead. Um, when we looked at the parking needs for the activities, for a typical practice what, what happens is, is one of the parents will drop the kids off for the most part at the field and they go home and they pick the kid up an hour, an hour and a half later on. There's typically only about four cars that are there for the practice for each of the teams. For a game, you typically will see eight cars that are there per team. There's two teams that play the game, but there's also two teams that are coming in to warm up. They're getting ready for the next game. So by the third inning of a softball game or by halftime of a soccer game, the other two teams have already arrived. So what we would be then counting is four teams at the same time. We also added two, two cars, two vehicles for the game officials. So when we show that games, we're looking down here at 34 parking spaces, we're counting a typical average of eight vehicles for one team, eight vehicles for the second team, 16, plus 16 for the two teams that are waiting to come in for 32, and the two game officials for 34. Um, we also have an ability to add 15 parking spaces right down here between the lot and the community garden. We do not think that they're necessary at this point. If the field turns into a tournament field at some point in time and we think that there's more, more parking that's available, right now those shrubs are there. They can be um, removed and parking can easily be just 
if that area was paved over it would be the same parking configuration that's in the rest of the lot so we would pick up an additional 15 parking spaces we were asked to identify who is currently using the field and who might use the field and the list on the lip the list on the left which is not always easy to say um, shows the baseball groups that are out there there is the adult softball group and adult flag football league that is out there we also know that we can open this up to the girls softball youth and adult soccer leagues junior giants program come up can come over here we can offer recreation programs we can offer camps um, the idea would be to extend softball into the to the winter season to extend an additional flag football leagues etc we also realize that there are lacrosse leagues that are out there that are very interested in renting spaces and then private groups that are very interested in, in, in renting out spaces. Um, when we put together the initial information, we, we listed it at the um, rate that's shown on the master fee schedule of $30 an hour and did our calculations. As we were getting ready with this, we talked to one of the design groups that um, does synthetic fields just to ask them for free feedback. And they said, everything looks wonderful, but your pricing is way off because synthetic fields in the county are, run are renting for 50 to $100 per hour. <coughs> so we then made an adjustment on that. In terms of scheduling, and I would like to go back for a second to show again that we have four different facilities that we're talking about. The batting cage, lion's field, the middle field, and then Bel Air field. And as we're talking about scheduling, um, based on the parking study, if all four fields are only being used for practices, or if only one of the fields has a game on it, then there's plenty of parking spaces to accommodate all of the activities going on out there. For the first year, our suggestion would be that if two games were scheduled, if there was a baseball game at Lions and a baseball game at Bel Air, or a soccer game at, at Lions and a soccer game in the middle field or something else going on, we would, we would schedule, we would not schedule the batting cage or the middle field um, to outside groups. They would only be used as warm up areas for the teams that are coming on getting ready to play the next activity. For tournaments out there, we would meet with the tournaments and talk to them. Tournaments have higher parking requirements than regular season games because people will come to the area and then they will stay there. Um, my team will be playing now, but we'll then play the winner of this next game. So we don't go back home as you would in a regular season game. Hey, in the regular season, it's an hour and a half activity. In a tournament, sometimes you're there for much longer. So we allocated 15 parking spaces per team when we looked at it. And what we said is tournament organizers, we will meet and discuss um, their schedule and then we will come up with an acceptable parking plan with them. We were also asked to take a look at which synthetic fields there are in San Mateo County. And so on, in January, I did a quick survey um, and found that there are 39 existing fields within <coughs> San Mateo County, combination of school fields and city fields, and that there are five more that are either under design or ready to go out to bid or um, currently out to bid. And so I, quickly was showing this information to the commissioners beforehand and was already told that this information is wrong because we know for a fact that there's more fields in Half Moon Bay than there are now. So it's 40 or 41 um, and we know that, that this is just what we did in the quick survey. The idea is that there's a lot of fields um, in San Mateo County. A lot of agencies have switched over to synthetics for the benefits that they provide also want to point out on this field that what we have is Skyline College's field down here and then we the other field that we're showing is Red Morton's field they are both fully synthetic the infields that you see there are also synthetic so when I said that that the dirt area would be synthetic grass that's what this is here it's just colored so that kids are learning the proper positions to play um, also, if you look at Red Morton's, you can see that it was lined for baseball, but also lined for soccer. And so they can have multiple activities, and the lines really do not affect the level of play for either one. Skylines is a baseball-only facility. As you can kind of see on the corners, they do have other synthetic fields on their campus as well. Um, 
A couple of other items that the Park and Rec Commission was discussing th during their deliberations, and one of those was um, an upgrade to the restroom facility. The restroom that is out there right now does not fully meet ADA um, specs, and it's also um, the idea would be that if we're going to create a, a, a wonderful facility, something that we're going to be inviting the public or the outside region to come into for tournaments and things, maybe to upgrade it, maybe to move it closer to, to, the, to Lions Field itself, um, add a concession stand. It's about $100,000 to build a new restroom facility on site, which is why in some of this we've identified $1.2 million and in another spot, we identified $1.3 million. So $1.2 does not include the restroom facility. But that is, was um, a consideration of the Parks and Recreation Commissioners. The other point is construction time frame. And the best window of opportunity to build a new field at the site would really be right after Thanksgiving, as all the leagues are just about to start at this point of the year. Um, Lions Field, right now, there's very little you can get on there right now because we've had more rain than in some of the past years. But once the leagues get on, they go th straight through till, till Thanksgiving. We have roughly a six week time frame that it takes or, or, or construction period from start to finish that it takes to, to complete and be ready to roll out the new carpet. If we do this right after Thanksgiving, we essentially <coughs> have all of the months of December, January, February, and March um, before anybody usually would be on the field anyway. So that would be the best window of opportunity without interrupting um, existing activities. The financial considerations that we were asked to bring back, um, here it does show the $1.2 million, and again, this does not include the restroom. Um, and that would be the full cost from, from the site survey work, the design work, the construction work, I think that includes the ribbon and the scissors to open the facility, but uh, I'll double check on that one later on. We are saving a little over 500 hours of staff time that is typically being used for mowing, for dragging the field, et cetera. Um, we were asked how much extra staff time would it take to rent the facility per year. If we're talking about all of these rentals, would that mean more of staff workload? And we really do not anticipate much of that. Most of the groups that are coming in that would want to rent the facility are going to be renting it in large blocks of time so that one, one 15, 20 minute visit with staff is going to take up several different rentals. It won't be, usually people won't come in and rent it for just a single day because um, we're renting more to leagues, established leagues or established teams. Um, the water savings, um, our estimate was 1.536 million gallons of water per year. When we went to the design group and had them review the report, they said that their calculations for the field came out to something like 1.48, but they were using rough estimates. They said 1.5 was well within um, <coughs> acceptable standards for a field of this size. We are anticipating about $50,000 of revenue, and even though we're, we would be using, that none of the money for the project would come from the general fund, um, everything that we would propose would be from outside of the general fund. The revenues of the programs can be put back into the general fund. And so that would be a positive there. What we are looking at for potential funding sources would be the user groups. And I know that Commissioner Pierce would be interested in a few minutes in also talking about that because he has had um, communication with several of them. Also talking to some of the community service organizations. Um, at the council's last meeting, um, staff was given permission to apply for um, one grant. We did apply for um, a $600,000 grant for um, under Proposition 84, and that was submitted, um, I believe it was last week that it was turned in last Monday um, was the deadline. We turned that in on time. Regarding the city's park and loo fees, we, um, the, the park and loo fees, as the city council is aware, those are fees that were put in from different housing developments. And those are fees that can only be used for um, capital improvement projects that increase the capacity of the park system. They cannot be used for 
maintenance. They cannot be used for staff members. They cannot be used to relight or, or re-roof a facility. It can only be used for, for projects that will add capacity to the system. Um, with the synthetic grass field, <coughs> by adding another three months of play, it is an acceptable practice. And the city attorney um, did a little bit of research, has talked to an outside company, and they said that not only is it acceptable, but many other agencies also you use park and loo funds to, to finance um, synthetic fields. <coughs> the current balance in the park and loo fees is $1.32 <coughs> million. Within the next six months, it's anticipated from Summerhill that we will receive the balance, the additional $536,000, um, bringing the total to $1.8 million. Council has allocated already $50,000 for the Catalpa project, and we are beginning that project, although um, you really won't see much out there with the, with the weather issues, probably for another month or so. But that would leave, um, after the Summerhill um, revenue is deposited into the account, it would leave $1.8 million left into the parks and loo fees. And tonight, um, <coughs> what we are asking council just to consider at this point is the, is the recommendation from the um, Parks and Recreation Commission um, was to <coughs> develop uh, was to allocate up to $200,000 from the parks and loop fees um, for all the pre-construction work, the site survey work, the geotech work, the design work. Um, that information will be useful to the city whether or not we decide to build a synthetic field now or in two years or in four years or in five years. This would address issues such as how do we tie into the storm drain system making sure that we have the proper elevations out there. We know really what is in the field. And we also then have the, the designs so that whenever the city is ready to move forward with the project, that, is, um, that work's already been accomplished. Alternate actions that the council can take tonight is to ask staff to bring this project back in, the two, in another month or two when we do the 2010-2011 budget um, there is a capital improvement project piece to the annual budget, and we can bring this project back at that time if the council wishes. We can also, um, if there's uh, any other information you would like to see, um, we would be happy to work with the Parks and Rec Commission and bring that information back to you. Um, the commission, can, the city council also has an option at this point to say that we are happy with it, we, uh, the field as is, and. And at this point in time, we're not ready to move forward with the project. The last option that we've identified is to ask the Parks and Recreation Commission to do a um, long, uh, to do a st strategic piece of a long-term look at the parks <coughs> and loop fees. And we do recognize that there are other needs um, within the parks infrastructure. And if the city council wished, we could um, look at long-term strategies before moving forward with this project. And before I ask the council if there's any questions or comments, I think I better turn it over to the Park and Rec Commissioners and see if there's anything that we should add. Well, I, I, I do want to follow up on Randy's uh, notation. I've had uh, plenty of opportunities to, to coach and play soccer at different locations in the peninsula, and it's amazing what they've done. And every park department, every youth group that I've talked with, They've all done it as a team project within the community and the city, and sometimes the school districts as well, to find a way to make these dreams come true. Um, our particular project is a win-win as far as I'm concerned. We, we've totaled up here um, the savings that we're gonna get. How many hours, 517 hours, what would be the savings right there on the maintenance time? The water alone would be a tremendous saving. This is a good way to save money for the city and provide opportunities to bring in more revenue as well as providing kids and adults an opportunity to play soccer. What we are going through right now, Randy touched on it, the very fact that we can't use most of the fields in San Bruno right now is a loss of revenue and a loss of opportunity for the kids to even play the sport. So I know that we can find a way within several groups in San Bruno to come up with money to help the city 
make this dream come true. That we would just like to get started on it in any way we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Two additional points I'd like to make. Number one is one of the groups that uh, is listed for the field user scheduling issues is youth, youth and adult soccer. Youth soccer in San Bruno serves about 1,300 kids in the AYSO program and another 300 in CYO. They currently use Crestmore High School as a field, which is considered the possibility of selling that, that particular field in the future. That's just one group that would be able to use that, that facility. Um, no longer are sport programs during a season. They're year long. You play soccer all year long. You go from one season to the next to the next. And my second point is uh, an example I just want to share. Is I, this last Wednesday, it rained all day long. My son had a game in Half Moon Bay. I, for sure, I was waiting for the call, but it was canceled. I left San Mateo. It was still raining. I drove over 92. The rain stopped. The kids were playing, and they were never phased by the rains from all day long. They played a full game on a synthetic field, um, which is the additional baseball field in Half Moon Bay. It's amazing. It's pretty awesome. So thank you for your report, Randy. I'd also just like to remind Council that this is an information item only. However, we are asking for direction on what to bring back, if anything, um, at a future meeting. And Randy, what, what is 517 hours equate to, approximately? A uh, quarter of a position. What is uh, a full-time position is, is um, 2,000 staff hours. In terms of park maintenance and things, there's been many different um, scenarios that many more add-ons to park staff um, lately in terms of the medians in San Bruno Avenue, the medians on El Camino that staff will be taking over next year um, as we move forward with the grade crossing and all the landscaping around there. It's significant. Um, I don't, um, what we, what we, we gain back with the 517 hours, I don't have a specific <coughs> answer of are we going to mow this area more or less, are we going to hit Fleetwood? That area we are developing right now as we're looking at the budget situation for 2010-11, um, but a quarter of a, of a staff member right now is fairly significant. All right, and then the water, you said about one and a half million gallons a year. Where is it supplied, wh who supplies it, who pays for it, who, tell me about that. Um, it comes, it's, the, the it is part of the normal water system. Um, it is not recycled, reclaimed water. We do not have that system um, in place. Um, it is part of the rate payer system. It is not charged directly against a, a parks account, but it is, it is broken up as is all the other um, watering systems for, the, for all the city facilities. It's um, put back into the general um, water bills. I noticed you have, uh, out of the $1.3 million, a very large contingency. Is that, and it's not an exotic type of structure that you're building. Is that uh, a cushion for drainage? Or how, tell me about that. That we, we beefed that up specifically because we have not done the, the pre-construction work. We haven't done the site surveys. We haven't done the design work. Um, when we spoke with the public services director, we weren't really sure how it was going to tie into the storm drain system, all the water that will percolate through the top layer of grass, um, how that will, that system, how the drainage system of the field will tie into the storm drain system. So we thought, let's make sure that we put more money for right now into the contingency. Um, that's exactly why we would at some point want to do the, the pre-construction work and the, the design phase because it would answer all those questions. So for now, we purposely made it higher than normal. Okay. Any other questions? To, to the Chair, one quick question for right now. Uh, <coughs> parking was uh, an issue I brought up last time, if you want to go to that. Uh, I still have a concern on that. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Pierce. Uh, Chair Pierce talked about uh, uh, even AYSO, so did Commissioner Davis. And, and obviously, if you go up to uh, Crestmore when AYSO is in session, parking is challenging. Um, bringing a facility that is fully established and that has activity going on, I still am concerned on the parking. If you go by there tonight when no activity was going on at, at Lyons, you're talking First Avenue, there's really no parking. Um, obviously, there is the av other available space. But something that I drove through tonight is you know, have we thought or has it been taken into consideration from the east side of the railroad tracks, 
because obviously the train station will not remain there forever, you have on that side 75 more or less spots, a couple of handicapped, the rest. So you're talking a potential of an additional 75 parking that maybe there's some deal or something that could be made. It's on this side, which is a, not across the street, which may be more of a safety issue. But, but it is Caltrans. But again, it's already paved. It's already there. It's established. Um, I don't know if staff's looked into that, but I think that's something that maybe can be looked into to increase the parking to what I think would be more of an acceptable level. Because currently, it does worry me that it looks good on paper, but when you actually have a great tournament going on and you have fans coming <coughs> forward and, and it's something, uh, it fills up quickly. So um, I don't know if that's something that's been considered. Uh, it was not considered, and we will go out and do a, a count and, and add that to the piece. Um, we also looked at a couple of the items related a little bit to parking, a little bit to the restroom. The amount of hours of new use is also primarily coming from the areas where Bel Air Field and the middle field would be closed anyway, as those would be natural grass. So in terms of the, because the question of restroom capacity brought up from the Park and Rec Commissioners, also a little bit with the parking issue that some of the activities that are going on right now at Lions Field, um, I think your example of a soccer field is one where there will be extra use out there because that will be brand new teams that are coming in um, and with more players um, in some cases out there. So we will look at the Caltrans lot and we will add that to our mix. So yeah, you. and you t already talked about restroom. That was probably one of my, the other second concerns is, um, you know, they haven't changed much from when I worked for the city and I had to go lock them at night or had to open them and be a scorekeeper. Not a lot has changed down in Lions Field, to be honest with you, over the couple decades. And um, obviously there's currently a structure there, the original firehouse, which has been used for daycare type facilities, recreational programs during summer and other periods. Um, I don't know if that can be evolved to where we already have a structure, though far away from Lions. Uh, not only to increase the bathroom capability as well as ADA compliant, um, but also to go beyond that, whether it's a, some kind of a concession stand booth, because obviously you'd have more uh, opportunities there. And if that facility is being underutilized, and I don't know currently what it is being used for, maybe that can be, uh, you know, because there is space and facility meeting and uh, locker rooms, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's been a long time. That have gone through there, but all that is sitting there too. But the bathrooms are, you're talking one per, um, you know, more or less, um, and, and obviously it doesn't meet ADA, and um, then you probably have the complaint that it's quite a jaunt uh, when the need arises. So there's that other factor. We do, we do hear that, yes. Any other questions, comments? Through the chair. <laughs> Park and Lou fees. Uh, you, you mentioned quite eloquently how what the restrictions are on park and loop fees. It, it has to expand the use. Uh, I know we have a, a master plan that the, uh, the Recreation Department went through, and I know there are some projects that are on cap, you know, long-term capital improvements. Uh, and then you also mentioned one of the options as far as the swimming pool. Uh, I'm concerned that we're going to use up a good majority of that park and loop, and that's one-time funds. Uh, has the Commission considered what that would do to any future projects that might qualify for, for those park and loop fees? The Commission has talked about that. They have talked about other projects that, that where park and loop fees may be accept, sec, acceptable uses, not just the swimming pool, but the dog park as, an, as another option if, if that were ever to, um, if there was ever a real idea that came forward to the table. Um, so those are types of uses. I think Catalpa Playground is the last playground that we would foresee doing for the next 10 years at least. Um, so there aren't, maybe aren't that many, but there's a couple in the swing pools, definitely a large one that has to be considered. The pre-construction work is probably around $150,000. We would be requesting up to $200,000 to see how that goes. At the same time, we, we would be requesting the opportunity to um, begin a fundraising campaign to go out and talk to the other organizations. We would not expect $1.3 million to come from Park and Lou fees. Um, as I mentioned, we have already applied for one grant and we would be looking at other grants. Um, we do know that National AYSO is interested in these types of projects. We know that there are other sports organizations, especially for youth that do provide grants um, of some amounts. So we would 
put on a serious campaign of looking towards those options. If the City Council at some point went forward with the full project, um, our recommendation would be to pretty much set a limit of what the Council would think were an acceptable amount of parking in lieu fees to use and then challenge staff and challenge the Park and Rec Commission to find the grants, to find the donations to come up with the rest of the funds. A, a, a related issue and the concern that was said about uh, uh, losing, losing Crestmore High School. Uh, if that fast forward and that happened, we would be entitled, the city would be entitled to park and move fees for that. And we would anticipate some in proportion to what, uh, what we've built up already. Am I correct? You are correct at that. Yeah. I mean, if it went. <laughs> <laughs> in, in general terms, we would anticipate that, but it would depend entirely on the, on the um, use of the property. We also um, view the need for those fields to remain in circulation as a priority issue in the current discussions that are occurring regarding surplusing the, the Crestmore property. So I wouldn't give up yet. But um, it, if that property were to transition, for example, to residential use in the manner that the Carl Sandburg site did, um, that it, you would reasonably anticipate uh, receiving park and move fees. But I, I, wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't want you to count on that at, based on what we know right now. My, my only concern, and I think it's a great project, and I think it's, not, it's one of those things where we can't, we can't wait or hem and haw about it because it's just going to get more expensive. Uh, and, and my whole life here in San Bruno has been fighting for fields and not enough space for our kids and the recreation. So I think it's something we need to go through. But I don't want another group to come forward and say, well, you said you were going to spend some money on the pool or you said we were going to fix this or whatever. So I, I trust that the Park and Rec Commission has, you know, has, has done some of that uh, research and, 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 and appeased those other groups that... <laughs> That may that may may not be that much in favor with this project. That's a, that's a great point you make. Um, we do meet twice a year with the user groups, <coughs> all sport user groups in San Bruno. Um, the dialogue between those groups has has been superior in the last couple of years, and it's been a very good open dialogue and extremely positive feedback. This issue has been brought up to them, it's been presented to them, and there's been a lot of positive comments. Um, one other comment I did want to respond to was. Uh, I'm going to call you Commissioner, I apologize, Vice Chair Medina about the parking. And that was definitely a concern I had as well when, when Randy initially presented it to the Commission. Um, the AYSO soccer is a great example. But understand it, at, on a given Saturday, there are six fields, there are 12 teams, there are 12 teams also coming or leaving. So at any given point, you've got 24 soccer teams at that location. So there's an enormous demand for parking spaces up there. So anytime you attend an AYSO game, you're struggling to find parking. That's the worst case scenario. We're not even looking, coming close to the potential for that, that number of fields. <coughs> if you went back. If I can just add to this point. Um, as Councilmember Ibera mentions, the other groups one of the advantages to this project was that it does support most of the established groups in town. That there is, that it does add play to, to the youth soccer, um, to youth softball, to Pop Warner football, to the after school flag football leagues. So this project does have something for most of them. Um, the aquatics issue, the there's no established group, but we definitely need to do something about aquatics within the next few years. So even though there's not a group that's going to come forward, staff still advocates for some improvements to the, to the pool. Well, let's go for that grant, get that grant. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yeah. For, the, for the chair, thank you. Um, I had a couple of comments. Where were you thinking of doing the new restroom? And I strongly advocate a restroom concession stand combination besides the old fire station, or have you gotten? Um, I'm just curious. There was there was lots of discussion about <laughs> that, <laughs> and at this point, I don't know if somebody said this is exactly the spot or not. But but I'll let Commissioner Davis tell me if I'm wrong. But I think this area, right area here mm -hmm. is the area that most of the commissioners said it makes the most sense. It's closer to the spectators. 
the existing restroom would be um, still can be used for the, the yeah, teams that are playing at, at <laughs> Bel Air Field mm -hmm. that are going on. This would provide most of the use for those at Lions Field. Yeah, excellent point. Um, as a parent, my daughter's 11. She's still not able to go to the bathrooms by herself. You know, you just currently the restrooms are located on the other side of the fence, and you could say center field. It's just too far to get there and mm -hmm. come back. Um, also, if there was a snack bar over there, I'm not sure I'd walk that far either because I don't want to miss a pitch or a play. <laughs> so, and I'm too lazy. Um, <laughs> but something that's more convenient so you can actually stay in the game and stay uh, stay with your kids. I think is closer and it, it, it'll get most use. Okay. I, the, the segue to that is when they're doing the study about how it all should lay out and what's needed and the drainage and all that stuff, if you have some idea that A, there should be the bathrooms and a concession stand in a given area, would that be part of the study? Yes. Okay. Yes, Good. we'll include that. I, I think we should do that. I, I, I have two more things. Um, one's kind of. I, I go down there to the 4-H very often, and I notice the geese that are on the fields all the time, and I know as a parent, I wouldn't want my kid <laughs> running up and down with the geese stuff all over the place. With the artificial field, yeah, well, <laughs> we're on television. <laughs> with the <laughs> artificial fields, is that is it easier to clean? I mean, do you, it, it, is there a, a cleaning mechanism, or is it, what do you do with them? Gallons. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> there are <laughs> yeah, no no birds allowed. <laughs> with with artificial fields, there still is an actually an irrigation system that's put in. And actually, oh, okay. just for a quick Didn't coupler, so you can hose down the field. Um, I don't know about geese out there, and I can check that's with our lot. colleagues to see if geese are more likely to land on artificial fields if it feels the same to them or not, or if they, if they go to the natural grass fields, because that would right. be an interesting question. And believe it or not, we have these strange discussions all the time. <laughs> But I will ask that one. Um, but we do hose down um, spilled drinks, or if there's gum that you're trying to get out, or things like that. So there is a hose, um, a quick coupler that can be hooked up, and you can still send that down. Okay. Okay. And then the other thing I noticed <coughs> in here, it talked about the life expectancy of the field is 10 to 15 years. So once the field is you, know, you have to replace it, and I believe it talked about $300,000 to replace it. I'm wondering, I know this is way ahead of time, but just to throw it out there, the money that you expect to raise um, as added income from rentals, maybe we should look at some mechanism that some of that goes back into a replacement fund for the field itself. So that was, those were my comments. Thank you. Anything else from the Michael. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make one comment that uh, I was really, um, really impressed with, with, this, uh, with this package that you guys put together and it's obvious that uh, your department and the commission put a lot of work into this and, and did a tremendous job on putting all this together. I, I really appreciate all the detail that you guys put into here, all the facts, all the figures, the pictures, everything. It really makes a, a really complete picture and, and a very compelling case for moving forward with this project. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, despite what Laura says, you guys are far from lazy. Uh, <laughs> you put an awful lot of work and effort into this, and it's, this is just going to be a great facility. I would just make the suggestion with the approval of the council that you bring back something formal, or staff, bring back something formal for a request for $200,000 for the research that has to go into this. I, I would wholeheartedly agree. I think the uh, commission with staff support have done a lot of research, spent a lot of time, reached out to a lot of people and the user groups and this is something I think that the community has wished for, sought and would love to see and I think it could not and, only and do anything but uh, improve the uh, overall youth and adult programs uh, and sports activities within our community. Good. Do you all concur with that? As long as we don't take as long mm -hmm. as San Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Years. We won't build it in the middle of a neighborhood. Not with Randy in the yeah. driver's seat. Yeah. Do you have your direction? We do. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have two items that uh, involve our shared chief. Item E, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement for shared police chief services between the cities of Millbrae and San Bruno. City manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, fortunately, the police chief did arrive just in time to support this item. Um, it, we've been... Uh, 
teasing him a little bit lately about what patches he might be wearing on his shirt, but we won't. We, we didn't check him at the door. We won't ask. Um, the item before you tonight is a uh, formalization of an agreement uh, and your authorization for me to execute that agreement between the city of San, Mateo, San Bruno and Millbrae. Um, we were just talking about San Mateo, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, this agreement would, uh, similar to the agreement that we have had in place now for two years with the city of Millbrae, uh, would arrange <coughs> for the sharing of police chief services in a manner similar to the agreement we have right now to share fire chief services with the city of Millbrae. Um, as you know, Millbrae's chief, Dennis Haig, uh, served simultaneously as San Bruno's chief, uh, and this agreement would be envisioned to function in a very similar manner. Uh, chief Neil Telford uh, would continue to serve as the chief of the San Bruno Police Department while simultaneously dividing his time so that he would provide police chief services to the city of Millbrae while they continue to operate a independent and, and fully separate department. Uh, the agreement that's before you um, addresses a variety of issues that have been the subject of some amount of questions over the past weeks as we have been contemplating formalizing this arrangement. Um, and in particular, it spells out that the chief would uh, uh, spend approximately 20 hours of his weekly work time providing police chief services to the city of Millbrae, again, very similar to the way that Chief Haig currently provides fire chief services. The costs for that uh, arrangement would be shared equally between our two cities with Millbrae reimbursing the city of San Bruno for 50% of the costs, all of the total wrap up costs of employing a police chief. Uh, and that amount is identified on page three of, of this agreement, although unfortunately it is identified incorrectly, and I would like to pause for just a moment um, to correct the information that's in the agreement, and we will certainly make that correction in writing uh, before this agreement is executed. Specifically, the uh, estimated amount for fiscal year 2009-10 is one hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred thirteen dollars and seventy one cents that amount uh, would be the fifty percent share that would be attributable to and uh, reimbursed by the city of Millbrae to the city of San Bruno um, further in that paragraph I would recommend that rather than uh, billing the city of Millbrae monthly that that amount be paid in quarterly installments uh, based on billing by us to Millbrae, uh, similar again to the way that that is done with the fire chief arrangement. Um, the agreement further uh, specifies, and this is a, a point that, uh, or a question that I've been asked on a few occasions, uh, and just to clarify for uh, the interests of the city council, the full employment relationship and responsibility would remain between the chief and the city of San Bruno. In other words, the chief would remain fully an employee of the city of San Bruno, uh, subject to uh, supervision and direction by myself, with the supervision and direction as it relates to city of Millbrae activities coming from the Millbrae city manager. Um, any employment related issues uh, would again remain fully the responsibility of the city of San Bruno. So uh, you, have, you have not given up uh, employment rights related to the police chief arrangement. Um, the, I think there are really uh, no other details that uh, require my calling them out as it relates <coughs> to the agreement itself. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I would like to just point out that um, the city of San Bruno and the city of Millbrae have enjoyed a very 
positive and I would say a successful arrangement and relationship in the um, joint fire chief situation over the past two years. As the council knows, uh, we are an al also engaged in a sharing relationship with Millbrae related to battalion chiefs in the fire department, which is also a very successful relationship. And by success, I mean not only has it effectively saved um, in the fire department over $350,000 annually, but the partnership is one that ha works well on an operational basis. Um, as your city manager, I can tell you that I have not experienced a situation <coughs> where by virtue of his uh, joint responsibility for the city of Millbrae and the city of San Bruno, could I identify to you that Chief Haig has performed or that the needs of the city of San Bruno in the fire arena have been neglected by virtue of the fact that uh, he's, he's essentially performing the same role for the two cities. And while the law enforcement arena is a different <coughs> one, uh, although a public safety operation, it is different than the fire service. Uh, both my colleague, Marsha Raines, the city manager in Millbrae, uh, the uh, interim chief in Millbrae, who is now uh, transitioning away from Millbrae, uh, Chief Telford and myself believe that this is a, has the potential for being a viable relationship, um, one that is, in, in my view at least, uh, important and, and even potentially necessary for our consideration given the fiscal challenges that both of our cities are experiencing. And again, with the good relationship and partnership and success of the relationship in the fire department, we are optimistic that this relationship and this uh, sharing um, arrangement will serve as a beneficial model for the city of San Bruno. Uh, I will allude briefly to the next item on your agenda, which is a study that would evaluate on a longer term basis whether sharing of a police chief and or other sharing up to and potentially including full consolidation with the city of Millbrae in the police arena is something, again, that would be mutually beneficial to our two agencies. And so with that in mind and the potential for conducting that analysis and looking on a longer term basis, what are the opportunities and what is the best uh, opportunity for <coughs> our two cities? I'm recommending that this agreement would remain in effect for an initial one-year term, which should give enough time for that complete evaluation to be, com to be uh, done and, and the results presented and considered by yourselves as well as the Millbrae City Council. And uh, the agreement itself, uh, absent any action, would automatically renew for two consecutive years, but again, I think that this is an arrangement that uh, both has merit, is an important initiative related to our budget strategies, and is one that uh, requires further evaluation uh, over a fairly short period of time so that we can troubleshoot any issues and evaluate alternatives and opportunities for the longer term. So. With that, I would answer any questions and uh, look forward to moving on to the next item. Any questions of the city manager? Please, Chair. Michael. Uh, <clears throat> I imagine that, uh, that Chief Telford probably works far more than 40 hours a week. And, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a division of, you know, 50 50. And I know every event I go to, the chief is there. And so I know he, he's uh, putting in a lot of hours. I'm wondering. Um, is there any idea of what what the impact is going to be? Because certain things I'm sure that he was doing are not going to be able to get done anymore. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I'm very much in favor of doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to know some of the details. I mean, are some things going to be delegated to command staff uh, that he normally would have done? Or um, are we talking about you know, possibly uh, not having them as available as, uh, as we've enjoyed in the past? Um, I would say that all of the above are probably true. 
uh, the chief will need to be, and he will be called. He will need to, and he will be called upon probably on a nearly daily basis to make choices as to the best <coughs> utilization of his time. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask Chief Telford actually to uh, start walking this direction so he can add any comments that that he might have, uh, being much more. Uh, close to the day-to-day -day operations of the police department, but I would say that the city of San Bruno is fortunate to have a very capable staff, uh, command staff within the police department consisting of three commanders. Uh, this is a, a uh, the results of a reorganization that uh, Chief Telford proposed when he was first appointed to the police chief position. and. Um, while uh, the shared responsibility falls directly on the police chief, I think it is fair to say that uh, the normal responsibilities of the commanders will be more full, fully utilized uh, as part of this arrangement. Um, and I guess I would ask uh, Chief Telford to add any additional comments he, he has. Okay, not because she's my boss, but what she said. Um, <laughs> as you've experienced tonight, uh, I have three quite capable and quite qualified commanders um, as second in commands. Commander Mark Catalano uh, is here tonight. So uh, with the use of my command staff, as well as what the city manager mentioned earlier, I mean, some events I may not be able to make it, uh, but if I can't make it, I will certainly uh, designate a second in command to attend. And that actually is the arrangement we have right now. Uh, if the chief, for whatever reason, can't be present, uh, it is very typical that, that a commander is assigned to cover that event. <coughs> Honestly, uh, if there is a situation that uh, the chief and I jointly agree that is really does not rise to the necessary level of his presence, he may not be there. Um, and. Uh, similarly, I, I think that you have probably seen Chief Haig present at most, if, if not virtually all, of the important city events here in San Bruno. Um, and again, I think that uh, while you may notice some differences, uh, it, it will be our effort to assure that the city of San Bruno's priorities and critical issues uh, do not suffer. One, one last question. Uh, is there going to be any mechanism to um, share any other costs beyond his um, salary and benefits should they arise, um, training, um, maybe use of vehicles, things like that, um, or, or is that out of the scope of what we're talking about? Um, it, it, that is not a, uh, a consideration that was previously made with the fire chief and has not been uh, fully factored into the cost considerations that are in front of you tonight. Uh, that is something that uh, I would certainly take in a, an additional look at. Uh, my, my estimate is that the cost of the vehicle and the cost of training, which is um, uh, fairly limited that 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 this is not a big exposure to the city mm -hmm. at the same time assuming that a similar agreement was in place for the fire chief I doubt that the city of Millbury would have any any concern about that and would be happy to take a harder look at those those related issues okay. Okay. sure thank you um, I just um, the mayor and I as you may remember Fran uh, mayor Franzella uh, pointed us as a subcommittee to review this in addition to fire. Um, we have met, we did meet with the chief uh, as council member Salazar. That was one of the questions we asked to the chief, um, whether he felt that uh, the service level would continue within this community uh, and that the command staff was capable and willing to step forward and assume any additional responsibilities that were necessary. He's assured us at the subcommittee level that that would not be a problem. Uh, I think as the, our chief has told us before, if there was a concern on a staffing component, I'm sure if there's a concern as this agreement, if it is approved, goes forward, there is an out clause uh, from either side. I think this is also a step that would assist us greatly in seeing if the next item that we're going to discuss, if it's, if it's approved, I think this is a great start to trying to see how things would truly work. 
And I think this affords us that opportunity, in addition to savings for both cities in these challenging times. And I, the, sh the chief, and correct me if I'm wrong, chief, that has assured the subcommittee that um, things will continue and the service level to the citizens of this community will not be affected. Is that correct? Absolutely. Good. Any more discussion? Action? If not, I'll go ahead and introduce the resolution. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Councilmember Ibera. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. <laughs> Sorry. Aye. <laughs> All there is. Mayor Rue. Aye. Okay. As the city manager alluded to, we do have item F uh, as our last item tonight is the adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Municipal Resources Group LLC to prepare a law enforcement services analysis report and recommendations for the cities of Millbrae and San Bruno and authorizing appropriation of $27,000 for San Bruno's share of the study cost. City manager. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Once again, similar to an experience that we have in the fire service, we are requesting the opportunity to contract with a qualified consulting group to do a, an analysis that would look at not only at the shared services arrangement with the police chief position that we were just discussing, but that would also take a longer term and uh, fully comprehensive look at opportunities for our two cities to partner if that is considered to be mutually beneficial for the two cities in the arena of delivery of law enforcement services. The, once again, these ideas are prompted by uh, a creative response to our current and continuing budget uh, restrictions or uh, uh, revenue constraints. And, um, so we want to uh, fully evaluate not only the current arrangement, but what other options might be out there, uh, both at a minimal to a, to a larger cost savings. The study would intend to look at uh, options up to and including, but not limited to, cons full consolidation between our two agencies and um, it would fully involve and consider the various issues and uh, uh, items of priority and concern within each of our communities. The study that's proposed would result in a written report that would be reviewed carefully both by the subcommittee of the city council as well as by the full city council and uh, the, your, your counterparts in Millbrae so that you have the opportunity to take a look at the results and to evaluate with no um, preconceived notion of what really is in the best interests of our two communities. You would have the opportunity to review, evaluate, and then subsequently to determine if there is an option that you'd like to proceed with implementation. And it's on that last point that I'd like to comment a little bit further before um, uh, asking if the consultants who are in the audience tonight would like to make a few additional comments. And that is that um, while implementation is not presumed and that there is no uh, uh, preconceived idea about any particular option that might be uh, determined to be of benefit and interest to the <coughs> communities. This study does not include um, hand-holding or wa working through an actual implementation process. And I wanted to make sure that the council understands that because there may need, it, depending on uh, where we get with the study and, and what avenues we would like to pursue, there may in fact be uh, uh, some to a significant amount of additional work that would be necessary to fully situate us into a longer term different arrangement if that is something that is of interest to our two communities. Um, with that, uh, the, there are two principals of the Municipal Resource Group present in the audience tonight, Mr. Mike Oliver, who is president of the firm, 
and Mr. Tom Sinclair, who is one of the principals and, and one of the primary staff persons uh, in their organization who would be performing the study. And if it's the council's interest, I'd like to uh, ask them to make a couple of quick comments about uh, their previous experiences and the um, opportunity that is presented in, in performing an independent analysis um, for, this, for their two cities. Please. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. I'm Mike Oliver, President of the Municipal Resource Group, and this is my partner, Tom Sinclair. Uh, just a quick overview, Municipal Resource Group is a group of six uh, professionals who have all had local government experience who specialize in different areas. Uh, we do recreation parks, uh, police activities, fire, uh, we do finance, some civil engineering, and uh, I'm sort of the, the overall guy. Um, we have had uh, between us a whole heck of a lot of experience. We don't want to add it up because somebody pointed out the United States probably wasn't existent uh, if you added all our numbers up. But um, we have been through a number of situations similar to this in our careers. Tom and I both have served as city managers in a number of cities. Um, I was the manager in San Leandro for a number of years uh, and at that point uh, was able to consolidate our fire operations in 1995 with Alameda County. And that was the beginning, that was another downturn situation, that was the beginning of fire consolidations in Northern California. Uh, subsequent to that, I've been the city manager in two new cities, the uh, city of Citrus Heights, uh, which incorporated uh, in the 90s, and then the city of Oakley most recently, and negotiated uh, contracts for law enforcement services in both of those cities, um, and have had varieties of other experiences with other cities, smaller jurisdictions, uh, in their service level considerations for law enforcement as well as a number of other areas. Uh, Tom's specialty area has historically been finance, although he was the first city manager of Orinda and also had a contract for arrangement for, for law enforcement. Um, we're really excited to see you taking a leadership role here in this uh, relatively new uh, area of consideration for joint and shared uh, services. Uh, as I mentioned, fire service consolidations have been around for some time and have been growing in their scope and scale. Um, we uh, believe that there are many similar characteristics in law enforcement services that can be provided uh, to the local jurisdictions on a seamless basis without losing those unique qualities that are so important to each jurisdiction. Each city, despite the fact that they may be adjacent to one another, has its own personality, its own character, and it's important to preserve those elements and to have the local law enforcement efforts recognize and honor those and maintain those. Um, that's one of the difficulties or the, the challenges you have in incorporating a new city with a new uh, law enforcement services, which we did in Sacramento. That was the first, uh, Citrus Heights was the first 90,000 population, first city to contract for law enforcement services with Sacramento County. And the third member of our team is a gentleman named Dan Drummond, who worked for the Sac County Sheriff's Department for a number of years, uh, has been the uh, chief of West Sacramento and has created a number of new uh, jurisdiction uh, service providers in Rancho Cordova, Citrus Heights, um, and uh, Elk Grove. So we're very confident that uh, this community has already gotten off to a good start with the shared uh, fire services and that law enforcement is something uh, under the leadership of your current chief uh, that could occur in one form or another. We haven't prejudged that. We haven't gone through your budgets. We haven't met with your staff. We haven't looked at your agreements for law enforcement uh, contracts with your service providers, and we don't know all of your configurations, and it's very critical for us to take this one step at a time, and that would be the first step in this process. Uh, we'd estimate that would take about three weeks uh, for us to complete that initial look at your services, to interview the staff, put the budget numbers and the operations uh, together side by side. Uh, then what we would do in this contract that would take another several weeks would be to identify those opportunities uh, for cooperation or consolidation or uh, joint sourcing of, of resources and work through those with the involved uh, personnel, including the city managers and the staff, the two departments. Um, at that point, we would then uh, take some time based on that input and draft a, uh, put together a draft report for consideration and evaluation. And that's testing the scenarios that are and the options that would be available. And we would not just come up with one 
uh, quote unquote solution, but we would provide a, an array of analyses of different options in areas that, that uh, the cities uh, could engage in, uh, up to and including a full uh, single uh, department. Uh, at that point, based on the input we would get from the, from the uh, potentially the community, the city council members, the staff, uh, we would prepare that final report um, for adoption and approval. Uh, and that also would include an implementation plan. We believe that the implementation plan is really the crucial element. Uh, once the, the two jurisdictions have decided what directions they want to go in, that step-by-step -step detailed approach with a timeline uh, generally is really the essential ingredient that we hand off and that the city could either use us to assist in implementing or someone else. But the point is that, that we feel that that is really the, the, the toolkit that you'd have then to be able to go ahead understand what you had to do, get that done, and to manage and monitor that, because that's very important to make sure that that occurs in the fashion that you've, d you've desired and, and when you made your decision. So be glad to answer any questions. Tom's here to answer questions, um, and we're here to, to help you. Questions of the consultants at this time? Michael? Uh, yeah, uh, just in general, uh, I, I <coughs> think that moving forward with this plan is, is definitely a good idea. Uh, we definitely need to look at what benefits are there. <coughs> And I think we are going to find some uh, savings in, in uh, sharing some services. What, what I don't really agree in, uh, agree on, and it's a, actually a very good thing that, that you guys are here to, to speak to this, because my proposal would be that we do this using city staff uh, from both cities versus using a consultant for this. And some of the, some of the things I'm thinking about here are. Um, so first of all, we're, we have to go back into the reserves to fund this. This is not something that, that we are, we're funded for. We've already dipped into the reserves. And uh, my colleagues up here made, uh, made it very clear that going into the reserves is not something that we like to do. Uh, we just had to do it in a big way at, at our last meeting. And uh, we'll have to do it again. Um, additionally, uh, I think that you know, even though staff is is, is pressed. I mean, our, our staff is shrinking. It seems like every time we, we have to make a budget decision, staff gets even smaller. So I know that they're really pressed for time. Um, but it seems like we're going to have to dedicate a lot of staff time to this effort anyway. Uh, you said three weeks to come in and, and interview people and kind of basically take knowledge we already have and kind of can it for us and then feed it back to us. So we're, we're going to make a significant investment in that time anyway. Um, I also thought that maybe going through this exercise might be a good development opportunity for our staff. Um, you guys were city managers at one time, and you know you've developed some expertise in this, and now you can you can sell it to other cities. But um, you know, fire last time, police now. Next time, maybe uh, uh, public works, maybe parks and rec get merged. It, it would be a great skill set for our staff to have. And here's an opportunity where there's not time pressure to get it done ASAP. We have the luxury of maybe taking a little longer, developing staff and, and uh, making a learning experience out of it. Um, being that we're sh gonna share a chief already, we have an opportunity to maybe let that settle in a little bit, um, make the, cu the cultures a little more aligned before we move forward with anything else. And um, also, if we do this, I hate to say it, by committee, where we involve a lot of staff in, in, the, in the development of the whole process start to finish, the ability to get buy-in um, on what we're doing going forward is going to be built into it. So um, those are the reasons why I would think we, we would want to do it in-house. And uh, so I would let you address those. Get Tom up here. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I think you've made some really good points. And um, what I would suggest, one other element that, that you might want to consider is this. And that is, um, I don't know if you've seen our logo, but it's a little hokey, but it's true. We're, we're, it's a grizzly bear. Uh, municipal Resource Group's logo is based on that. And one of the things, Tom went to Cal, so he thinks it's a golden bear, but it's not, uh, I didn't, I'm a state school guy. But uh, basically, um, in past years, when I've had to reduce workforces and I've had to save millions of dollars in the budgets I was responsible for, I, we always involve the, the, the staff in those uh, discussions and would hold all hands meetings, uh, would put together teams, would get everybody involved in that. Um, and to a great degree, what that does is it builds a synergy in the organization for the organization to think about those issues. The difficulties I think that, that one encounters 
um, is that or that there is a relationship um, within that organization that bonds that group together. And that same relationship on occasion can keep that group from being able to um, individuate, that is to be objective and take a look at the organizations overall without considering the personalities and to look at it from a more structural and a more uh, dispassionate view. And so part of what we're providing, we would hope, would be some objective experience that's outside of the two organizations that looks at the organizations um, in a more dispassionate way and has a sense of what the, uh, I won't say the real needs, but the needs that independently one could consider. Now that doesn't make it easy uh, for those who are recipients of some of those those issues, um, but it, I think it, it, it may be, uh, in these cases, effective in the long term to achieve the goals that are, that are desired. And part of it is that um, the in-house solutions, generally speaking, don't get where you really need to go. Um, and the reason for that is they just haven't been out in the state of California either doing this in other cities, having had those experiences, and seeing uh, what in fact has been done in other, other areas and can be done. And bringing that expertise to this, this endeavor is what we, we would be doing. Uh, Dan Drummond has, as I said, been 30 years experience in law enforcement in a variety of situations, in a variety of different organizations, and not only setting up new uh, departments, but also uh, in West Sacramento, rebuilding an entire department and looking at how to modify and exchange uh, and change that organization to fit the needs of the community. And so I think that's basically <coughs> what we bring. Um, certainly, uh, the input from the organization is essential. It's very important, and buy-in in the longer term is important. Um, but I think that s more structural look at the organization and the cost elements and the service elements uh, is, is what we bring. Thank you. If I might add just a very quick comment, because uh, I know other council members would like to speak on this. Uh, uh, in addition to what Mr. Oliver has suggested, and I, I might um, suggest that it, your staff uh, most likely has the ability to do the study, I can assure you that it would take us substantially longer uh, than it would take uh, the group that, that is proposed here tonight. Um, primarily because of one item that uh, Mr. Oliver uh, suggested, and that is that uh, exposure and experience to a variety of other situations, while something that we could uh, uh, develop the necessary familiarity, would take uh, significantly longer than, uh, than, than this team would provide. Um, the, the second and perhaps more significant issue and, and uh, really uh, from a from a day-to-day -day operational perspective, um, it is true that we have reduced our staff, we've reduced um, our services and our service capacity, um, and this is precisely the type of thing that uh, would require us to have a, 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 a pretty focused conversation on exactly what are we not going to do in order to uh, be able to devote the time that would be necessary in order to uh, produce the work. So uh, just offer that for your consideration as well. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't question your experience. Uh, <coughs> sounds as if you been through many scenarios. Uh, you had any situations where you probably had to say it's not going to work, uh, that they're you know, <coughs> in, similar to, to what we're looking at? And what sort of challenges are, are we looking at? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, w it's too early for us to really have a sense, other than the fact that we believe that it's very positive that the two organizations have worked as cooperatively as they have on other issues. Um, there are situations where it won't work, um, and we um, are very proud of our independence and our, and our objectivity. Um, if that concern came up, we would certainly share that with you, and that was uh, an item, as a matter of fact, we discussed with the, the City of Millbrae City Council also. They asked the same question because um, we have to try and maintain um, uh, the representation of the best interests of both entities, and if there's a discontinuity there, we would certainly bring that up and point that out um, without hesitation. I mean, not in a, you know, overtly public way, but we would certainly.
try and convey that concern because uh, it doesn't always work as well as one would hope in some of these situations. And, and it's funny because when this first issue first came up, uh, I guess a few weeks back, something, one of my comments would be, well, if they're working for both of us, would they comment on what each of us are, might be saying about each other? <laughs> It would be only good things that we were saying about each other. <laughs> it's nice to go with all good things, but you know, it's, there are things that need to be said sometimes. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, through the chair, you obviously would go forward and you would be talking to a lot of the staff on, in both cities, and that is at all levels, from command down to uh, the patrol? And, and we take our cue from the, the chief and the, and the city managers for Certainly, but yes, that would be our expectation. So you're speaking to everyone within the department, not just the administration, not just the command staff. Well, I say everyone. I'm not sure about the dispatchers and those folks. I mean, but we'd certainly try and, and sworn and personnel s sample. Yeah, sample as many folks as we could. Talk to them and set those opportunities up for sure. Yeah, and and, uh, and I appreciate Councilmember Salazar about the funding source because it's something that obviously is dear to my heart. Uh, and. You know, I do realize that uh, we're saving 40000 for the remainder of this budget cycle with the, the, what we just passed with Milbrae. I know we'll be saving over 100000 in the next budget cycle uh, out of the general fund. Um, I was hoping that maybe there would be some left over. I think I've been told as of it's probably going to be very tight as we end on June 30th um, in hopes if we do have, maybe we can repay back some to the reserves if there is anything remaining from cost savings. But I also think going forward, uh, I think it's important that we have an established uh, somebody who's of the neutral party uh, who can interact with both agencies that they feel confident with. In addition, they're going forward and they're, they're talking to all uh, people within the department. So I think if we had a command staff person or the chief asking a patrol officer, so let me ask you this. I don't know the, um, if we would get the same response and honesty. I don't mean that they're hiding something. I just mean that sometimes with an outside party, you get more upfront, frank conversation and dialogue. And they've done this, for, uh, obviously, for a living for some time. And I think that the, is the kind of information that we need, independent um, eyes to come in and say, can this and will this work? And based on what they know and the knowledge that they have, put the two cities together, is this a viable opportunity for our future and for the, the betterment of the citizens' service level during these hard times and reductions? So for that reason, I'm, I'm willing to go forward with this in hopes that we won't have to actually dip in that, that whole amount when we come and look at it June 30th. I, I, I have nothing. <laughs> Yeah. I have no voice and I have nothing to say. Okay. I just uh, want to make a brief comment, too, and it will be brief. Uh, I think the foundation is laid. I, I know that the council members in Millbrae are very positive on this, and uh, we have a very good relationship in the fire. We are expanding, potentially expanding our, our fire services when that consultant uh, uh, finishes. But uh, we'll see where that goes. But it, it's a very positive situation. I haven't heard anything negative other than some questions, which, in fact, you will uh, flesh out pretty well. So I think it's very exciting, and I look forward to it. Uh, this is a uh, resolution that someone would like to introduce. I'll go ahead and introduce the resolution. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Council Member Ibera. Aye. Council Member Salazar. No. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Ruin. Aye. We've done item 11 already. Uh, 12, comments from council members. To the chair. A uh, couple things, and bear with me, uh, but I'll try to make it brief. I, I just wanted to say, even, even these, in these challenging economic times, it's um, rewarding and beneficial to see folks willing to step up and do what they can to assist the city in whatever way they can, or within the community. Uh, I mean, going to a bone marrow uh, drive last Saturday in South City for a Crestmore Elementary child um, and the outpour and these uh, people coming from San Bruno there to become donors. Um, from somebody who emailed me who anonymously wants to fund planting a few trees in a certain area of town uh, and wants to pay for it all. But what went further is obviously we have our annual Easter egg hunt coming forward and obviously we're all aware of the current budget constraints that we have. Uh, and I didn't really go out, have to go out too hard or too far and was looking for potential 
uh, some folks or agencies that might be businesses to offset some of those costs, which I've been told is, is $1,000 for that particular program that goes on annually. And obviously we want to continue that on, not that anybody was saying that it was going to stop, but without even having to look too far, and when I just talked to a couple, before I knew it, Harry Costa had called me and said, you know, Rico, I went to, Ken, you might be familiar with them, uh, a civic group, uh, the Lions Club of San Bruno, and uh, we will provide you a check for $500 for the city to ensure that this program and the youth that it serves continues on. And then before I knew it, I had another phone call. Um, Terry, who went to the board of, uh, with the San Bruno Rotary, um, they came forward and they also gave a check for $500 to pay for the other part of that program. And that to me is something that says not only about what the Lions and, and the Rotary Club already do for the community and the outreach they have here in town and beyond that, but for them to come uh, willingly without even being really asked and for these folks to come forward to ensure that this program and these kids have a free provided Easter egg hunt again, I think is commendable and I appreciate it personally, um, their willingness to help this city out and this community and, and the youth. Any other uh, council member comments? All right, we'll go to item number 13. We do have a closed session tonight. There are four items and I will read them. <laughs> Number one, closed session for purpose of consulting with legal counsel regarding the matter of City of San Bruno complaint number R 2010-0004 for administrative civil liability filed before California Regional Water Quality Control Board, San Francisco Bay Region, February 16, 2010, California Government Code S 54956.9A. Uh, item number two, closed session to confer with legal counsel regarding Baykeeper versus City of San Bruno, United States District Court, civil case number 00753 SC California Government Code section 54956.9. Uh, the third item is a closed session for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel regarding pending litigation in the FCC program access complaint, Wave Division Holdings LLC et al. versus Comcast Corporation et al. File number CSR 8257-P, California Government Code S 54956A. And the last item is the City Manager and Human Resources Director request a closed session pursuant to California Government Code Section 4957.6 regarding direction for labor negotiations with the San Bruno Professional Firefighters Association, Public Safety Mid-Management Bargaining Unit, Miscellaneous Group Mid-Management Bargaining Unit, San Bruno Police Bargaining Unit, and the San Bruno Management Employees Association. And I don't believe we'll have any action to report after this. That's all of them. Okay. That's all of them. <laughs> uh, item number 14, this meeting is adjourned until March 23rd right here. Uh, City clerk? Yeah. Nothing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to adjourn. A moment of silence for uh, um, Gus Franzella, who is Larry Franzella's uh, father, passed away just the other day. Services uh, will be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at St. Uh, Gregory's Church in San Mateo. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.